how do you make a movie of the backrooms and not have it feel like it's just an overproduced cash grab? One, I'm very happy with the people we landed with, A24. They are very generous with the amount of creative control they want to give me on this project. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you want to watch this episode completely uncensored with absolutely no ads, click the join button down below to become a member. Members are going to be getting a lot more than that very soon. But anyway. Hello, Kane Parsons. Hello, Anthony. <laughs> I almost said Kane Pixels. Would you? Would you have? Would you uh, have no, walked off set? Uh -huh. eh, sort of the same person. Same, same person. A few different. I tried my best. <laughs> 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 so this is your first in-person interview ever. Yes, it is. Are you tired of being known as the backrooms guy? I think it's a good thing to be known for. <laughs> yeah. For the most part, there's some little caveats we can talk about. But yeah. Uh, for the most part, I'm very happy with my work and mm -hmm. like to be known for it. How did it all start? I was between projects at the time. I had been doing these Attack on Titan historical footage videos yeah. for like the past year, most of 2021. But I did those for a while. I sort of exhausted that uh, convention and I was just looking for things to do. I was doing little tests here and there, just sort of stumbling around till I found something. And I came across, uh, it was a really simple beginning, really. I just came across one of the backrooms images again. I thought it was neat because I, I love environmental horror. I'm very obsessed with uh, the look and feel of spaces, especially uh, hostile spaces, mm -hmm. just ones that feel like they don't really make sense. And I wanted to try to uh, create my own liminal space in, in Blender somehow, because that's what I'd been using for a while. And so I did a test. It was in the back rooms. That's the most prominent liminal space out there. It was a shot of um, a guy rounding a corner and a chair hits the wall. That's actually a, a clip in the around the end of the actual full Backrooms video. I Did you of, use the actual one yeah, that you... Yeah, I sort of oh. built it around that that one shot. And I do that a lot. I, With a lot of my works, I sort of reverse engineer from a certain moment I really want to happen. Yeah. And uh, sort of unfold from there. A lot of the stuff in the series was coming from a combination of ideas I had had floating around in my head for a while. So most of it is predating the Backrooms idea. The Backrooms is more of just a... a uh, texture to wrap over everything. Did you have people coming to you being like, this isn't the creepy pasta back rooms that's that I know and love in my head that I read on Reddit and 4chan every day? Well, that, yeah, that's what happened. I, I was vaguely aware of the back rooms, or I was aware of it in terms of the original image in the caption that I saw on Instagram two years before. I think most people know the one I'm talking about. If you know clip out of reality in the wrong areas, that image. It's kind of like a liminal space. Yeah, I'm sure area. you've seen it. It's definitely mm. the most famous one, but uh, I had no idea there was this community behind it. So when I put out the first video, I was surprised to see all these people uh, saying, you're doing the backrooms wrong. What is this? Yeah. What, there's supposed to be Smilers on level one. Or, I, I don't, I'm, that might be wrong. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah, wicked yeah. people. But yeah. uh, there's all this terminology I'd never heard of. So it was confusing. I think for the most part, the response was still very positive, but that carried through for a while until eventually it, it seemed like people almost forgot about the old one on, on like a mm. larger scale and now mine's sort of been adopted as the the leading it's canon. culture. I don't think they're I don't people are so caught up in what's canon and what's not. It's yeah. weird. Like I don't think it matters. I think everything is canon to itself. The lore goes so deep almost with the, just as many things that are unsaid or unshown as the things that are shown on camera. I mean you have uh, people dissecting your videos. You have the film theorists. I think they made like five videos dissecting the backrooms. Those yeah, have like over the... 30 million views. That was crazy. Yeah. They're getting more views than I am now in the videos. Does any of their analyses dictate where you take your series? No, no. The the outline from the time that I started putting out videos on this end, it was mostly materialized. The whole story hasn't changed and it definitely hasn't changed because of uh, certain theories or ideas brought up by people in the community, so. Mm. You hear that, Matt Pat? You do not have any power over this man. <laughs> Sorry. No, you think you do. No, he's, yeah, great guy. Thank you, Matthew, for all your coverage. <laughs> but no, sadly, you do not influence this series. <laughs> You're creating stuff that's so outside the realm of normal YouTube content. I think that's probably why people are so fascinated with your story. Yeah. Because you didn't follow the footsteps of what has been established as the only way to ensure that you get a lot of views. Why do you think it was so successful? If we're talking about the, the original video, yeah. I think one, it was a very clickable thumbnail. It had the big uh, stringy 
life form fellow standing there. Official title is life form. Life form fellow. Life form fellow. Yeah, sorry guys, you gotta update the wiki now. <laughs> a lot of people were vaguely aware of the backrooms at the time. So the first few days were probably a bulk of the viewers were backrooms wiki fans, people who are already very familiar with the backrooms. It just started snowballing. People wanted to hear what it was about. People started sharing it. A few days in, there were some channels reacting to it and mm -hmm. it was just unique enough that people wanted to share it around and mm -hmm. it picked up. Or someone's just like behind the scenes just decided to make me go viral. I don't know, that's 50-50. <laughs> do you remember when your video first started going viral? Yeah, I do a daily journal. I like logged it as it was going on. So I, I can look back on that. You're like captain's point. log number <laughs> day 75. <laughs> it, it was, you don't really realize it's going viral. It's a gradual thing, but it was probably around like week two that I started feeling like, okay, it's not stopping. Like the first two days it plateaued at around like half a million. People started sharing it and within like what two weeks it had like 10 million views and then 20 and all the while I was just so busy working on almost immediately I was working on the other videos that it I never really had time to bask in that or anything. You weren't just refreshing the YouTube analytics? Well I, well, I was. I was looking at the, <laughs> the comments in my yeah. downtime but very quickly there wasn't a lot of time to reflect because I just wanted to be making more stuff and it's so time consuming that you're just mm. making, making, making sleep, school, making, making, making sleep, school, put out video, read comments. Yeah. Making, making, making. Did you know that your life was going to change from that moment? Hmm. Life is always changing. Damn. So. Truer words have never been Whoa. said. It's insane how things move and do it's things. It's like things are constant and nothing is permanent. What? We keep doing this like surprised bit. I don't, I don't know what this is. <laughs> it's just going to be a constant <laughs> surprise bit. I think one of the interesting things about what you're doing is it was done with without any budget, without a big team. It was all from one creative vision. And I think that that's that kind of magic is what's felt in a weird sense. Mm. Like, I feel like it would just be lost if if a huge team came in there I, and I did agree. that. I agree. So, I mean, how do you how do you prevent that when you're you're making a movie? Yes. So how do you make a movie of the backrooms and not have it feel like it's just an overproduced company cash grab? I think, one, I'm very happy with the people we landed with, A24. They are very generous with the amount of creative control they want to give me on this project. Obviously, there would be points where the producers and studio would give notes, but we both want the same thing with this project. We're both going for the same end point. Yeah. Um, they're not trying to turn it into some crazy action flick or something. Yeah. The film won't be found footage. It'll be through a purely cinematic lens. Yeah. And I think there is a special quality to keeping it purely found footage, but the story I'm telling is sort of branches outside of the area of ooh, eerie, weird atmosphere, strange room geometry, and it becomes a lot more personal and conceptual in a lot of ways. And that's just not something that I'll be able to pull off in the found footage mm. medium. But I have methods in mind that I want to uh, exercise while shooting the film that will preserve that special quality the backrooms has. I feel like you're not going to tell us how you're going to do that. I'm not. <laughs> I really want to know how you're going to, how are you going to accomplish that, that homemade kind of feel while it's still so produced? Yeah, we'll find out. Tell me more, god damn it. <laughs> um, Probably not as exciting as you're thinking, but hopefully it will be. You also mentioned that you have an unconventional creative process. Yeah. What does that mean? That's very I don't scary. know. I don't know. Okay. It's so unconventional, you don't even know what it is? Yeah, no, I just make things. Like, I'll black out and I've got a video there, fully yeah. exported. I don't know where to start with it, really. Because, I mean, I go about the production process the same way most people would, but I am willing to focus on very small, minute details for longer than I think most people would. I enjoy the process of, like, fleshing out a, a scenario or a universe more than uh, a normal piece of fiction would. So you're aware enough of all these small peripheral things that when I'm telling the more engaging main story, you feel like anything could happen or it could yeah. go in any direction and mm -hmm. it in turn just feels a lot more tangible and real. And you mentioned that you played a lot of sandbox games growing up. Yeah, any, definitely. Anything could happen. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel that from your series. It does feel like a video game in the sense where it almost feels like you're watching someone else play a video game where anything can happen. Yeah, yeah, it feels very free. Like for me, the backrooms has never been scary. Um, I mean, of course, Realistically, if I was there, I'd be I'd be <laughs> freaked out. But I've always just wanted to run around it there. It seems like a cool place to just look at stuff. When you're in a dream and you're exploring all these strange, like warped versions of places you know in your life. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you're in the dream, it feels like the actual your actual house. But then when you wake up and reflect on it, it's that wasn't my house. That was uh, a, a Walmart. 
Um, <laughs> do you care about retaining the vision and the feel of the viral stuff? Absolutely, absolutely. I do not want to hand over the car keys and let it turn into something else. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this if this if the idea was for it to mutate into something else mm. because no amount of money, I mean, maybe maybe a few billion, that, <laughs> but but for the most part, money can't substitute the the feeling of having a project you're invested in. Yeah. Um, because everything you do, no matter what, you're always gonna get desensitized to it mm -hmm. in some way. So you have to, in order to be constantly engaged and constantly motivated to do new things, just put yourself in a situation where you're always moving up a hill rather than plateauing and sort of reaching downwards mm. to where you've already been. As soon as I finish a project, I feel good for having it done for like one day. Mm. Uh, and then instantly I start to get hit with this like need to make something new and this unrest. I don't know if it's just a, a me thing. I, I physically need to be making stuff. I need to mm -hmm. have this uh, light at the end of the tunnel to be running after at all times. Do people tell you that you like kind of skip some steps in terms of uh, getting a movie out there? Oh yeah, I mean it's, it's, it's a weird process, like having this amazing situation come up with no previous knowledge. Like I have no experience yeah. outside of this. This is my first intro experience to the film industry. So you're so, like, oh, I just create something and then movie, a movie version becomes a thing. Oh, like, nice, that, that's this pretty is your cool. Norm. Yeah. yeah, and that's probably gonna have, uh, yeah. it's gonna be interesting to see going forward how, how that impacts just the future for me. But, you mean where um, you think that you create something and then everything's handed to you after that? No, no, I'm, just, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I'm it's, kidding. it's, it's uh, been such a smooth experience so far yeah. that it's, I haven't been made aware of all of the potential uh, pitfalls, that's a backrooms title, um, Ooh, nice. you could, you could uh, run into on a project like this. So I'm learning the ropes um, as I'm doing this, but when it comes to the creative side and the, the actual production side, I feel very confident about that. That's already what I do. Mm -hmm. It's more so just the, the business end of things that I'm learning as I go. Definitely, they, they, they are not people who are eager to turn it into a whole franchise and do all this crazy stuff with it. It's actually my personal goal to, to get a limited series out of it. Like streaming Yeah, services. Yeah, it doesn't matter where. I just need to tell the rest of the story because the film isn't the, the finale or anything. It's more of just a, think of it as a large episode of the YouTube series that's sort of told in a slightly different way. Mm, so in a sense, it's almost going to be the pilot for the bigger series. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Or all of it is sort of... I think of it all as one thing. I don't care about structure, I don't care about genre, mm. anything. I just ignore all of that and just make what's in my mind and let mm. other people determine the labels for themselves. So you're kind of creating a, a cinematic universe yeah. of your own. Sure, if you want to use that label. Yeah. Yeah, just a single world and single timeline of events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you tired of being called a genius? I don't, <laughs> I, I think it's hard to get tired of that, <laughs> but. You're uh, a genius, you're a genius, you are a genius. You're a genius. Okay, I'm You're tired a genius. Of it. <laughs> I'm just gonna shut up. Or are you just like, no, that's just that's just me. That's just me. I'm not yeah. trying to be modest. It's just, it, no matter even with all the amazing stuff that's been happening with this, it still just feels like me at my computer doing work. It, it doesn't feel like this huge colossal shift has happened since everything is blown up. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing what I've always done. I haven't put more effort into the series than things I've done in the past. It's just sort of my standard work process and. People just really like this specific project, and mm -hmm. I hope they like where I'm going in the future. Of course, I can't lie and act like my uh, expectations for myself haven't been raised, and I'm yeah. not. I don't. I'm not obviously under more pressure now, but uh, for the most part, I feel pretty free of a lot of that, and just sort of free to do what I want. Are you tired of the leading description being? The background was created by a 16-year-old, like it being all about your age. Oh God, yeah. We all. I mean. I think it's it's a a cool reminder to people that you don't need to have you don't need to be a seasoned professional to get into this line of work. You can make something uh, genuinely engaging mm -hmm. at pretty much any age. I mean, I can only speak for sixteen and up. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hope that inspires a good number of people. People yeah. have already been inspired by that. I've seen a lot of people making their own series uh, adjacent to mine, and uh, some of them are younger than me. Some of them are around the same age, and that's been amazing. Very. Uh, uh, it's been wonderful to see that. Right now, my 17-year-old goal is to just keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Ideally, build more of a name for my, and a brand for myself, being able to have uh, a level of stability where I don't need to rely on external studios and mm. uh, companies to get my projects off the ground. But um, yeah, generally, I'm 
where I want to be right now, and I can't really speak to the future. But I can't go without thanking BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Therapy has helped reframe my view of the world and myself by allowing me to feel empathy for my younger self and therefore understand who I am today better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in helping with motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp screens other therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're certified and licensed and provides customized therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone or even speak over the phone if that's not something that you're entirely comfortable with. One of the most difficult parts of beginning therapy for me was finding a therapist that I actually clicked with and the price of finding a therapist can start to get really expensive, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy, where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. So with all that said, I wanna give a huge thank you to BetterHelp. We're giving a spend today with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's betterhelp.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of King Pixels. Are you, Thinking about leaving YouTube behind? Are you always going to stay on YouTube? I place? plan to always stay on YouTube. I I don't want to abandon this. Yeah. Because again, I my roots are in the internet. Really, I just want to make stuff. And whenever I'm not making stuff in a studio, mm -hmm. I'm going to be going to YouTube. Because again, mm -hmm. I can't not be making things. And YouTube allows for a lot of things I can't quite get past the the pitching phase to these bigger people. Because a lot of my ideas are just so weird and unconventional in format that it just wouldn't. It wouldn't work as a film. It would. It mm. only works in this strange, unexplained uh, uh, internet format. Because I don't like explaining my work creatively for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I like to just let it speak for itself and then I just stand there silently in the background. Just let people look at it. Here's a video. Well, that's why there's so much lore created about your content that you didn't even write. It's just people develop it well, and yeah. create it Yeah, themselves. that's... <laughs> the Backrooms has mutated drastically since then. There are channels... Uh, I don't want to say pretending to be me, but this channel's using the name Async. Some of them are uh, verified. They get almost as many views as I do. They mm. have the hazmat suits. They have uh, the same characters as me. Technically, you took the concept of Backrooms and created something bigger. Yeah. So but now people have took your, taken your concept and created something else. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because in like a, a normal film setting, that would just be uh, copyright infringement. That would... Yeah. be the theft of IP, but on the internet, everyone owns everything, pretty much, yeah. it feels like on YouTube. Even if legally they don't, mm -hmm. it feels like you do, and in practice, you do. I, I don't have an issue with that. I think usually it's a, I, I, I like that. That's a good thing. With the Backrooms, I think almost everyone is in agreement that the concept of the Backrooms has uh, been trashed pretty badly mm. in the past uh half a year or so. Super oversaturated. It's gone, well, it's gone down the YouTube kids rabbit hole. I, th I think you probably know what I mean by that. There's yeah. all the Poppy Playtime vs. Five Nights at Freddy's, Hello Neighbor, Backrooms Level 1 Billion, mm. Level Burger King, stuff. <laughs> level Burger King? Yeah, well, they, they've started, they just do level instead of number. It's just a, a word. Yeah, it's got a large child audience, definitely grown out of Roblox and everything. That is weird. Um, you accidentally and, created a, a section of the internet for kids. Well, but kids love horror. Um, I mean, I loved horror growing up. I liked the darker sides of uh, Portal and Half-Life, those games mm. when I was younger. And Doug Ratman and Portal, he was like my childhood boogeyman. <laughs> um, I would like hear his rambling at night in my head. Do you see a lot of negativity or negative comments and things like that? For the most part, I mean, yeah, it's been extremely positive. Um, overwhelmingly so. And I thank everyone for that. That's been incredible. People say, don't read the comments. I, I read the comments. It's hard not to on just a, a purely human level. It's mm -hmm. it's nice to see nice things about your said about your work. Um, but then sometimes you'll see a, a negative one and that, that definitely sticks out. It it you look at it for maybe like four times longer than a positive mm -hmm. one, just trying to mentally figure out how to argue with what they said. But it's just opinion and mm -hmm. your opinion is equal to theirs. And then you so. click the off button. Yeah, you delete it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always into filmmaking? Like as a kid, I mean, you're still a kid. No. But as a more, as a kiddier kid. <laughs> I've been doing this since before I was making memories. So like, this has just been my default state for my whole life, pretty much. I, I started being conscious at maybe like six, nice. maybe, maybe. I don't know, and then I, I think I lost it again and then I got it back in like 
12. Did you black out 6 to 12? Yeah, I don't know what happened. There, <laughs> Those are the pivotal years where traumas are born oh. and they stick with you forever. Well, I started making a lot of videos around that time, mm. so I think I, I think I just freaked myself out with all the stuff I was making. But no, no trauma. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's been the thing I've been doing my whole life. My dad is uh, in the VFX industry uh, on the game side of things. Uh, you would expect there to be a lot of overlap with him teaching me things, but that's never been the case. Yeah, he was talking to me beforehand. Yeah. He was like, I just let Kane do what he wants to do. I'm not pushing him to do it. So your dad isn't isn't like saying, you're going to become a VFX artist. You're just no. observing and kind of learning just by, by watching. No. Both of my parents are extremely supportive. They're both incredible people. But uh, there's never been a moment where they've really had any expectations for me. I, I feel very happy with how they've done things. Good job, parents. <laughs> Nine out of ten. <laughs> Nothing's perfect. Oh, nothing's perfect. You, you, can, you can tell they didn't push you to do it because you love doing what you do. Yeah. I feel like when you're pushed to do something, you immediately want to reject it a little bit. Yeah. I don't know where it came from, but that's all I've wanted to do. And mm -hmm. it's just sort of been the same me, just experimenting with slowly better and better technology, like graduating from Windows Movie Maker to like Filmora and iMovie and, and finally plateaued at Premiere, After Effects and Blender. So a lot, and Fruity Loops, I mean, FL Oh yeah, FL Studio, yeah. No, no one calls it Fruity Weirdo. I, I got, okay, so you're talking to a guy here that grew up on the internet, 2003, I had Fruity Loops, okay? And it wasn't called FL Studio, it was still a Fruit weird Loops. pun on Fruit Loops, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what was your childhood like? Uh, for the most part, my childhood was just comprised of creating stuff in games like Minecraft and Little Big Planet, and the bulk of my creative time was expressed through drawing and sandbox games. Fourth grade, I was started doing the YouTube videos, but it was more like uh, low-key Minecraft gaming stuff. But then eventually, it, it it spiraled into the grabbing a camera, telling a story, looking up how to make short film on YouTube, and so how to make short film. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> You said that your parents divorced when you were seven. Right. Do you think that, you know, that, that kind of tumultuous time in your life pushed you to, to pushed you to get more creative? It was definitely not rough on anyone in the family. It, it was a it was a divorce, but it wasn't a bad divorce. It was like a good divorce. Yeah, they, yeah, it was a great divorce. Yeah. It was so much fun. Uh, no, they, they they still get along, yeah. so it's all healthy there. But I think the biggest impact on my life from that was sort of the realization that upon seeing this thing, like my parents' marriage, which s seems like a solid thing that couldn't ever change. It was like just part of the universe growing up at that age. Seeing that just suddenly stop existing and just split apart into something where neither of my parents knew exactly where they were going from there. That sort of made me realize that there isn't a inherent direction to anything. Mm. And uh, anything can turn into anything and there just isn't really a set of rules. So if you think of it like that, then there was really no reason why I couldn't spend as, really throw my all into doing what I want to be doing. No one's right, really. No one's right, yeah. no one's wrong. It's just, if you want to do something enough, there's no good reason why you shouldn't. So that's what I did. It led to a lot of existential crises around that time as well. Uh, thinking about death a lot and I mean, of course, everyone goes through that phase somewhere in life, but I got that at like seven. Mm -hmm. um, and that still comes out in my films because it's something I think everyone has to face and uh, can be very hard to get comfortable with that. But I think I've, on paper, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I've gotten, I've gotten to a good place there, but I think there's a lot of nuance to explore in that fear and how it affects all your choices in life. What's next? Well, this project is still far from done. Uh, I'm working on it every day. I have uh, the first draft of the, the film script. I mean, obviously this is coming out in May, I would assume yeah. around then. Uh, outside of that, I am working on uh, some other smaller things just for YouTube, more mm -hmm. of just creative passion projects that uh, you guys will probably have to get used to a little bit. At this point, two, a few episodes of that could already be out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm gonna do in the future mm -hmm. because again, I'm stepping away from the meticulously planned like logistics of the Backroom series and just going back to my style of making a thing and just going with it creatively. I'm sure you guys will be semi-familiar with that at the time this video is out. You guys? Uh, or me guys? <laughs> I'm laughing, no. <laughs> no, you can't. Oh. Don't laugh, never laugh. Mm -hmm. Don't ever laugh. Dead puppies. <laughs> How could you laugh at that? I told you not to laugh at that. It's kind of generic. <laughs> it's, like, it's like everyone says dead puppies. Everyone says dead puppies, but you always laugh when you hear it. And that's... Mm. You're laughing. You're laughing. You're all laughing.
Just have to wait long enough. Next question. I was going to get a tear out, but I'm glad you stopped me because that would have been a lot. Um, <laughs> be there for hours. Yeah. 